Okay, good morning, brothers and sisters. Shall we begin with a sound of prayer? This morning we're going to uh, do. <clears throat> we're going to continue with this theme about the scapegoat um, in part six, and um, this has proven to be quite a, <clears throat> a deep topic, and um, I believe that this particular topic is really going to bring about uh, the division of these two groups right here, and um, it's already. We already start to see that taking place. Oh, the people that have rejected the truth are fighting against it, and um, those only those that are keeping up with the advance in glory are able to see the things that the Lord wants us to see through this. But anyway, there's another point here that it's pointed to, and it's very profound. So I want to talk about this this morning, and let's begin by going to Genesis 25 and verse 23. It says, And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. The one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. So, <clears throat> we understand that right here, this is, in Bible prophecy, it's the womb. Right, it's, the, it's the, talking about the, the belly of the whale where Jonah was in for three days. This is this final test that God's people are coming upon. And we know that this final test is the investigative judgment. It's typified by these uh, two goats in the, the Day of Atonement. And it represents these two classes. And here in this illustration, we have these two classes. It says there are two nations in thy womb. Right? So let me just write here, right here. Two nations. And these are these two classes. And one is stronger than the other. And the one that's stronger is the one that's going to serve the younger. So the stronger is the elder, and the weaker is the younger. So the whole Bible is bringing us down to this point where these two classes are finally going to be separated. And there's a separation all the way. You know, there's a separation that takes place here in the Sunday Law Begins in the first group of false prophets. But the whole focus of Bible prophecy is right down to this, this last um, final test here where the investigative judgment of the living is taking place, where this manifestation is going to take place. And if we go to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Now the point I'm making here is that the promise in Genesis 25 verse 23 is that the elder shall serve the younger. So there's the promise. The promise was given to the younger. Okay. It says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is of no more promise, but God gave it to Abram by promise. So there's these two seeds, the, the seed of promise, and the seed that goes by the law, right? And we've been looking at this a, a, a lot lately, right? But the promise here, these, the weaker, the younger, this is the seed of promise. And the stronger, the elder, is the one that's represented by the law. It's self-righteousness, human strength is what's illustrated. <clears throat> 
And in Galatians 4 and verse 22, it says, For it is written that Abraham had two sons. It's the same illustration. The one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. So it's Mark and these two sons here, and one son is, is Isaac, and the other one is Ishmael. Right? So let's just put these in place. Isaac and Ishmael, right? And the, the weaker son here is speaking about Esau. Ah, excuse me. Speaking about um, Jacob, sorry, not Esau. And this is speaking about Esau, these two sons. And the two sons here of Isaac and Ishmael are just a, an allegory of the exact same thing. It's constantly showing us this same illustration. For it's written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Okay? So the promise was given to Jacob that Esau would serve him. The promise was given to Isaac, right? But in both cases, Esau was physically stronger than Jacob and Ishmael stronger than Isaac, right? So you've got these children of the flesh being illustrated here against the children of the promise. Verse 24, which these which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar, for this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. So, through this lineage right here, you are free, but in this lineage right here, you are in bondage, and the bondage represents sin, right? Okay, and the, the, obviously the free is freedom from sin. So it's all about sinners and those that have overcome their sin. That's what these two illustrations are referencing. And back to Genesis 25, in verse 24, it says, And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. So these two nations, Jacob and Esau, are twins, right? These two nations are twins. So the Bible has to explain it itself. Okay, what does it mean that they're, they're, they're twins? Um, in Leviticus 16 and verse 5, it says, And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. Now we know that these Two nations, these two sons, these twins, they're all represented the, the same illustration that we see in Leviticus uh, 16, right? It's about these, these two classes right here. So it's calling them twins, but when you go to Leviticus 16, you've got these two goats. Um, and these two goats both had to be without spot or blemish. By looking at them, you couldn't tell the difference. They were twins. It was only it was only through the Lord casting the lot that you could see the difference. And what I understand, the casting of the lot, it was the message. When the message comes, it reveals what's in your heart. Okay? Whereas the wicked, they cast lots, right? And it's their evil message, right? Because you have these, you have these 12 spies, go right here, you have these two groups. One gives a, a true report, one gives an evil report. Okay, the evil report, right? Is directed against their brethren, whereas the true report was that they trust in God's promises. That's the difference between the two. So the, the, the God's lot casting will reveal who the wicked are, whereas the wicked's evil casting is always directed at the righteous. Right? It's these two false 
uh, the true and false message. So, <coughs> um, these, yeah, the, these twins are these, are these, these two goats. Um, now it says here, um, going back to Genesis 25, verse 25, and the first, the first of these twins, came out red all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. So the Lord, through his word, right, is going to teach us the um, spiritual attributes of one of these twins, right? It says, the first came out red all over like a hairy garment. So it's likening him to a hairy garment. And we, we know this, we, we've read this already in Isaiah 118. It says, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So Esau is a symbol of sin. Right? He's one of these, uh, the, 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 these twins. And he has on him this red garment. <clears throat> and we, we, we know that um, these, these two goats, the other goat, which uh, represent Christ, he had on this, this, he has on the wedding garment, right? So you've got this, um, this contrast. And we were, in fact, we will look at this when we go through, you'll see how these garments, although prophetically speaking, this one's red and this one's white, Okay, um, you can't tell the difference by looking at them, right? This is the Bible revealing something about the character here. And you'll see as we go through that it's very difficult to, to determine. But nonetheless, the Bible is explaining the attributes of this group in comparison with the attributes of this group. <clears throat> so it goes on to say about Esau, Verse 27, and the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, right? So the Bible has to interpret itself, and in Christ Object Lessons, page 70, paragraph 2, it says, the field, Christ said, is the world. So Esau is a man that likes to go out into the world. Now, this this group of people here, both classes, represent the church. And when we were going through um, this part two of this illustration, we put in place that on the vision at the end of the 2300 days, Sister White sees the Advent movement. And the Advent movement is his church. But then she specifically says, she sees two classes, the church and the world. Because in the church, there are two classes. There are those nominal, preferred, professing to be uh, God's people, in name only, but those that actually follow God. They hear his words and follow him, right? And that's these two classes here. One has on the wedding garment, and one has on the sinful garment. So it says that Esau, right, he goes out into the world. But it says, but we must understand this as signifying the church of Christ in the world. So this is the church of Christ in the world. The parable is a description of that which pertains to the kingdom of God, his work of salvation of men, and this work is accomplished through the church. True, the Holy Spirit has gone out into all the world everywhere. It is moving upon the hearts of men, but it is in the church that we are to grow and ripen for the garden of God. So it's about the church reaching out to the world, right? So Esau is somebody that wants to go out and reach out to the world, right? And you'll see because in Genesis 27 and verse 3 it says, Now therefore, take I pray thee thy weapons, thy quiver and thy bow, and go out to the field and take me some venison. So <clears throat> Isaac 
tells Esau to go out into the field and he's to take his weapons, his bow and his quiver of arrows with him, right? So what does that mean? In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 16, it says, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Esau represents the wicked, and it's his fiery darts, right? So you have to put your shield of faith up, because remember, the stronger is going to come against the, the younger. We, we, we will see that here in a moment, right? So Esau, right, his fiery darts is something that you have to fight by faith, and you, we will see this clearer as we go on. In Psalm 57 and verse 4, it says, My soul is among lions. I lie even among them that are set on fire, even the sons of men, whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue is sharp sword. So the mouth, represented by the teeth and the tongue, are represented by spears, arrows, and a sword. Right? So these weapons is the, is the mouth. Right? It's, 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 it's a message. In Psalm 64, verse 3, it says, Who wet their tongue like a sword, and bend their bows to shoot their arrows, even bitter words. So <clears throat> Esau right, goes out into the field, right, and he has a bitter message, right? It's a, it's a false message that he, he has, right? So um, basically, I mean, as I would understand this, he's gone out to do public evangelism and he has a false message. This represents these false shepherds here. And we will see that much clearer as we go through this. Um, <clears throat> but coming back, to, coming back to Jacob now, in Genesis 25 and verse 26, it says, And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was three score years old when she bare him. Now he was called, uh, Jacob means supplanter. And right from his birth, Jacob, by grabbing the heel of the firstborn, because Esau, let's right here, he was the, the literal firstborn. Jacob was his supplanter. And Jacob, from the moment he came out of the womb, he was trying to grab hold of this title. He wanted it, right? So it's teaching us something prophetic. A supplanter means to, to like overthrow or, or to put you, take somebody away, put yourself in place of them, right? Um, I mean, it's not, a, it's not a righteous thing. But it's teaching us something prophetic here that Jacob was prepared to go to great lengths to obtain this, whereas Esau, you know, we know, did not value this. This is what it's teaching us. It's teaching us about how much he valued this, which he despised, right? And, and that's the key here, what we have to see. And it says in verse 27 that Jacob, uh, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents, right? So what does that mean? Well, in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 and 9, it says, By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and went out not knowing whether he went. So, Abraham believes the promise that there was a land going to be given to him. He didn't know when he was going to be given it, but he was going to be given it. And it says, by faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles or tents, with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. So they dwell in tents whilst they wait for the promise, right? And in Numbers chapter 9 and verse 22 or in 23, it says, Or whether it were two days or a month or a year, that the cloud tarried upon the tabernacle, remaining thereon, the children of Israel abode in their tents, 
and journeyed not. But when it was taken up, they journeyed. At the commandment of the Lord, they rested in their tents, and at the commandment of the Lord, they journeyed. They kept the charge of the Lord at the commandment of the Lord by the hand of Moses. So the children of Israel had rebelled right here, this rebellion, these two classes. And therefore they were sent into the wilderness for 40 years. And they were to tarry in their tents. It was a commandment when the Lord rested uh, upon the tabernacle, they were to tarry. When the Lord rose up and went forward, they were to go forward. It's, it's this principle. When the Lord says tarry, he means tarry. And they were doing all this, tarrying in their tents, until they got into the promised land, which marked this point uh, symbolically. So you can see that the commandment of the Lord is to tarry in the tents. So you can see already that the, the contrast, the twins that the, was on the wedding garment, he Tarries, whereas the firstborn Esau, he does public evangelism. And he has a false message. It goes on to say in Manuscript 57, 1909, paragraph 4, I have thought a great deal about the experience of the children of Israel. The Lord took them from the Egyptian bondage, and for 40 years he led them in the wilderness, separate from the idolatrous nations. Consider the lessons which he taught them at the mount. When he proclaimed to them his law, he desired them to be a peculiar people, separate from the wicked nations around them. He desired them to gain an experience that would fit them not only to possess the land he had promised them, so it was the promise of the land, but also to carry out his purposes in their individual experiences. During all these 40 years, they were led by Jesus Christ, enshrouded in the pillar of cloud. When the Lord wished them to tarry in any place, there the pillar of cloud would settle. There would they pitch their tents until the cloud lifted again and moved on. So when the Lord says tarry, it's a commandment. You, you don't go anywhere, you tarry in your tent. And in Acts chapter 1 and verse 4, it says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith, Ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So the inheritance of the promised land is also the inheritance of the uh, promise of the, the latter rain. Okay, so you have the promise of the land and the latter rain they're all marking the same promise that you get right here if you tarry and wait for the, the, the promise so they're also told in the upper room we know that we have this um, 40 days in the wilderness come to this point this, this test that takes place with Christ and Satan comes down test them three times the Children go into the wilderness for 40 days and this rebellion takes place and then they are sent into this wilderness for 40 years. Right? And it's this... Excuse me. It's this wilderness here where they are tarrying in their tents. Okay? So... <clears throat> It's, we know that the tarrying time begins on the first day of the first month right here. So they first get told to tarry here. And we see this in uh, Luke chapter 24. And the Lord then, just before he ascends, after the 40 days when he comes back, he confirms this and tells them to again tarry. And we put this in place. We are showing that at the end of the 2300 days, on October 22nd, the Lord says, wait here. And it's marking this point, right? You have to wait until the marriage, right? So the promise is that the, the marriage will take place right there. So you're told to 
Tari. And he's talked to Tari here, and then he reaffirms it again here. And that's important that we see that. Um, and Romans chapter 9, it says, verse 6, Not as though the word of God had taken an effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. So Esau and Jacob, they represent in this sense Israel, but it says they're not all Israel. Okay, So some of them that are represented here are not Israel. And we know that this group here is, is not, and this group is the group of promise. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So, although Ishmael was the seed of Abraham, it doesn't mean that he was part of the promise. Isaac was the one that the promise came. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac. So basically right here, the paralleling um, Isaac and Ishmael with Jacob and Esau. Right, showing you this the exact same story. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Right? So Let's put this in place, right? So it says God loves. God hates. What does that what does that mean? In Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 17, it says, I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. So the Lord's clearly telling us, telling us who it is he loves. He loves them that loves him. In John 14, 21, it says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and manifest myself unto him. So, to love God is to keep his commandments. In Deuteronomy 7, verses 9 to 10. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them, that love him and keepeth commandments to a thousand generations, and repayeth them that hate him to their face. To destroy them, he will not be slack to him that hateth him. He will repay him to his face. So God hates those that hate him, and he loves those that loves him. Right? So those that hate him, he hates. Right? And this is what is shown. And those that love him are those that keep his commandments. So when he says, tarry in your tents, and it's a commandment, he loves them that tarry patiently in their tents and wait for the promise. But he hates those that disobey the commandment and take it upon themselves to go do a work that they've not been fitted up to do, especially when they go forward with a false message. <clears throat> it says... In Psalms 11, verse 5, the Lord trieth the righteous. He's going to try you. But the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. So it's telling us that these love violence. And how do we see that? Because in Galatians 4, 20 and 29, it says, Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit. Even so it is now. Because this group here, the group that's disobeying God, 
that are not tarrying, that have got a false message and go out into the world to do public evangelism, when the true message rebukes them for it, they are going to persecute their brethren. So, when you go to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15, it says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Now, in Leviticus 16, you have these two goats, right? They've got this sheep's clothing on, or this, they're without spot and blemish, both of them. You can't tell the difference. And he's saying, Beware of false prophets, right? Beware of false prophets which come to you with this clothing on you. You, you can't tell the difference. Because but inwardly, they're, they're evil. Only God uh, is able to determine this. <clears throat> I mean, reading somebody's heart, but we, we will see that, and, and we understand, it's by their words and actions, as we've gone through earlier, that they betray themselves. In verse 21, it says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, the will of his Father is to tarry, not to do this. Many will say to me in that day, how many? Many. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? Then And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So, this group, these false prophets, it's telling us there that they are going to prophesy in his name, cast out devils, and do many wonderful works. But he's going to say, I don't know you. Let's read from Christ Object Lessons 412.3 and onwards. At the final day, many will claim admission to Christ's kingdom, saying, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? But the answer is, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are, depart from me. In this life they have not entered into fellowship with Christ, therefore they know not the language of heaven. They are strangers to his joy. What man knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Saddest of all words that ever fell on mortal ear are those words of doom. I know you not. The fellowship of the Spirit which you have slighted could alone make you one with the joyous throng at the marriage feast. So having the correct message. It's the oil. In that scene... You cannot participate. Its light would fall on blinded eyes. Its melody upon deaf ears. Its love and joy could awake no chord of gladness. In the world benumbed heart. You are shut out from heaven by your own unfitness for its companionship. We cannot be ready to meet the Lord by waking when the cries have behold the bridegroom. And then carrying our empty lamps to have them replenished. So those that go into the cities and say, Lord, Lord, and do this this work, right? Casting out demons are the foolish virgins that wake up right here, right, and realize they have no oil. And we will see that in this next quote. Faith and works, chapter forty-four. Uh, sorry, page forty-four, uh, paragraph four, and 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 and, and onwards. Thus Christ identifies his interest with that of suffering humanity. Every attention given to his children, he considers done to himself personally. Those who claim modern sanctification would have come boastingly forward saying, Lord, Lord, do you not know us? So this group, this group of false prophets also claim modern sanctification. They claim to be holy, right? Have we not prophesied thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? The people here described who make these pretentious claims, apparently weaving Jesus into all their doings, fitly represent those who claim modern sanctification, but who are at war with the law of God. They're doing public evangelism with a false message, and they're getting power from Satan, right? 
whereas they're tarrying in their tents, waiting for the promise. <clears throat> it says, Christ calls them workers of iniquity because they are deceivers, having on the garments of righteousness, right? Having on the garments of righteousness to hide the deformity of their characters, the inward wickedness of their unholy hearts, the wolves in sheep's clothing. Satan has come down in these last days to work with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. These are those that receive strong delusion. His satanic majesty works miracles in the sight of false prophets, in the sight of men, claiming that he is indeed Christ himself. Satan gives his power to those who are aiding him in his deceptions. Therefore, those who claim to have the great power of God can only be discerned by the great detector, the law of Jehovah. The Lord tells us, if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. The sheep's clothing seems so real. So you can't tell the difference. They're twins. Okay, right here. So genuine that the wolf can be discerned only as we go to God's great moral standard and there find that they are transgressors of the law of God. So you've got to cast lots. The lots will reveal what's in the heart. The lots is the message, right? Um, we saw that in Leviticus 16, it was Aaron that cast the lots. Aaron was the high priest. Joshua is also the high priest. He represents God's people who are giving the message in here, interceding for those lost sheep. And they are able to discern between good and evil in the sense that they're, they're casting the lots, they're, they're testing and proving all things through God's word, right? And they are detecting the false against the true, this true report, uh, true report and false report. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, it says, Little children, it is the last time, and as you have heard, that Antichrist shall come. Even now there are many Antichrists, whereby you know that it is the last time. Antichrist puts himself in the place of Christ, saying, I am Christ, and deceiving many, right? It's these people right here. And in 1 John 3, verse 7, it says, Little children, let no man deceive you. This is what Christ said. Let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that tarries and doesn't do public evangelism is righteous. Now, just before I continue reading on, if we go to, uh, I think it's 2 Peter, chapter 1. Yes. 2 Peter chapter 1 says, and verse 4 says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. You're the children of promise. That by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Right, and there's these eight steps. But it says, <clears throat> verse 9, But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. So, we understand that right here, this group that gets manifested here was once here, it's these 12 disciples, one of them is Judas, and they get given power. And that power is this message that comes down right here, which is Re Revelation 18, one to three. It's the power you're given to become the sons of God. And all you've got to do is keep gathering that or all the way down and maintaining this what the Lord has given you. And right here it's this first birth, right? So you're you're purged from your sins. Now it says here that he's forgotten that he was purged from his sins, right? So he's forgot something. And the controversy right here, because this was typified by 2014. These are these types that teach us. And this would be for us, point A, okay? Midnight crying in the middle. 
in 2014, one of the main uh, doctrines that came forth right there that separated two classes of people was public evangelism. So right here, you get purged from this sin of public evangelism, this false doctrine. It's like you realize that's wrong. And now you begin to tarry. And right now, when you get here at this point, Christ reminds us, tarry until you receive the power from an eye. But one group is going to forget that they were purged from their own sins and they're going to repeat the sins of their fathers right here. It's very, very profound. Very frightening. It says, goes on in 1 John 3 and verse 8, He that committed sin is of the devil. Right? You're the children of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. The the message that you are given right here that rebuked this sin of public evangelism remains in you, right? You're not going to do this sin here because you remember this experience, you remember your past experience, and you hold fast to it right here. <clears throat> in this, the children of God are manifest, they're manifest right here, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Whosoever goes in and does public evangelism is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. Because when they do this, they persecute their brethren. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning. That you should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. So again, she's marking now Cain and Abel. Same story, same outcome. One has a one follows the path of righteousness, one follows the path of unrighteousness. He gets rebuked and he murders his brother. That is the story. Of the gospel. It goes on in first selected message, page 204, in paragraph 2, it says, The enemy of souls has sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among Seventh day Adventists. Seventh day Adventists, right here. And that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith and engage in any process of reorganization. Were this reformation to take place, what would result? The principles of truth that God in his wisdom has given to the remnant church would be discarded. A religion would be changed. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as error. A new organization would be established. Books of a new order would be written. A system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. The founders of this system would go into the cities and do a wonderful work. The Sabbath, of course, would be lightly regarded, as also the God who created it. Nothing would be al allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. The leaders would teach that virtue is better than vice, but God being removed, they would place their dependence upon human power, this human strength. Which, God, which without God is worthless. Their foundation would be built on the sand and storm and tempest would sweep away the structure. This is Matthew chapter 7. These false prophets, they go into the cities, say, Lord, Lord, they do all these miracles, but it's Satan that's given them power to do it because they receive strong delusion right here. And it says, their foundation is built on the sand and storm and tempest would sweep away the structure. It's, this is the Omega Apostasy, this public evangelism. Now, in Deuteronomy 13, speaking about these false prophets, 
It says, If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Okay, <clears throat> now we will read more of this in a minute, but I want us to understand is uh, firstly who gives these signs and wonders. In Matthew 24, 23 and 24 it says, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there believe it not, for there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. We read that in this quote referring to this group right here. Okay, so <clears throat> there are these false Christ claiming to be like Christ, false sanctification. Uh, and they show great signs and wonders. So in Deuteronomy 13 it says, uh, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign of the wonder coming to pass means that they give a correct fulfillment, but they then tell you to go after other gods, right? So it's teaching us that at the end of the world, there is a group represented by this, they're going to give a prediction, it's going to come to pass, but how you know that it's false is they get you to go after other gods. So they're going to use their, their correct prediction to try and make out that they are the true prophets. Satan is going to give them power right there and they're going to be doing miracles. Everybody's going to look and think they prophesied correctly, they've got power, they're claiming that there's this outward look, the, sh the sheep's clothing on. You're not going to be able to tell the difference. They're twins, right? These are on a righteous gamut, but the only difference is they're tarrying. They are disobeying God's commandments. Uh, in so much that if it were possible, these shall deceive the very elect, the children of the promise. In Daniel 11, 36, it's going to teach us or explain to us what these false gods is that they're going to get you to run after. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods. And shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honour the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honour, with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many, and shall divide the land for gain. Now, this is talking about the papacy, and worshipping a God that you knew not. And how do we worship Satan? We worship him on Sunday, right? So when you go after other gods, you're, you're worshipping on Sunday. If you worship on Sabbath, you're worshipping the God of gods, the creator of the heaven, earth, and sea. This is how you know which one you're worshipping. So, we know that the papacy is the man of sin who thinks to change times and laws. And he says, I've changed the Sabbath to Sunday. And it's an external illustration of the false prophets internally, right? And we know that in Spald McGann it says that they, they hated us on account of the Sabbath because they could not refute it, right? And we've just read there, they go into the cities, do a wonderful work, and they lightly regard the Sabbath. So it's teaching us that they are going to reject the Sabbath. And in Psalms it says, It's time for thee to act, Lord, they have made void thy law. This marks the point where the Lord is going to act. Okay? So when you come down to Deuteronomy 13 and verse 3, Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God, and fear him, and keep his commandments, and obey his voice, and ye shall serve him, and cleave unto him. And that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams, shall be put to death, because he has spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, 
which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shall thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. Now, in the rebellion that took place right on the banks of the, uh, the promised land, Phineas takes a javelin which represents the message and he, you know, stabs this rebellion, this, this man, woman, uh, I'm trying to remember his name. Um, <clears throat> it, it doesn't matter right now, but... Um, <clears throat> Anyway, he, he, the, the, this, this brother brings this Moabitish woman into the camp and um, he, you know, he picks up this javelin and he straight away goes to them and right in the process of them committing this fornication, he stabs them right through and he stays the judgment. Okay, so it's very, it very important that, th that this act took place uh, and it was classed as, as a righteous act. So... It says here in Deuteronomy 13, when they tell you to do this, you have to put them to death. So it's teaching us something, that something spiritual, because obviously you're not going to pick up a sword and start slaying your brethren, right? It's about giving you message. And <clears throat> we know that in the story of Jeremiah, when Hananiah, the false prophet, rose up, Jeremiah says, you have to wear this wooden yoke, meaning to go to the cross, Sister White says. Hananiah says, no, you don't have to go to the cross. And when Peter told Christ that he didn't have to go to the cross, he called him Satan. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so you have this, this representation. And Jeremiah prophesied against him and he died. Okay, in the book of Ezekiel, you have these 25 men that bowed down to the sun. And in chapter 11, Ezekiel prophesies and one of them dies right there. He's teaching us this point that um, <clears throat> when... When? Because they're making a prediction. Somehow it's going to come true. And they're going to get all their brethren now to walk after strange gods. They're going to be worshipping Sunday. And this is, the, this is the key point that you have to see, right? They're doing public evangelism. They're honouring Sunday. Oh, all sorts of rebellion go right on, uh, right on at this point. You have to prophesy against them and tell them that they are going to die for this thing, right? And <clears throat> okay, so that's how you have to put the evil away from the midst of thee. So, <clears throat> and back to Jacob and Esau, in Genesis 27 and verse 6, it says, And Rebekah spake unto Jacob our son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau thy brother, saying, Bring me venison, and make me savoury meat, that I may eat, and bless thee before the Lord, before my death. Now, now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. Go now to the flock, and fetch me from thence two good, good kids of the goats, and I will make them savoury meat for thy father, such as he loveth. And thou shalt bring it to thy father that he may eat, and that he may bless thee before his death. And Jacob said to Rebekah his mother, Behold, Esau my brother is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. So, right here, in this story, you've got Esau going out to do public events, and he represents the, the wicked. But what you've got left, you've now got this illustration of the mother telling Jacob, uh, to do something evil, right? Now, we have to see this in a prophetic light. We have to work out by context who these, what these symbols represent. Now remember, when Jacob came out of the womb, he grabs hold of the heel because he wants this birthright. He wants to be the firstborn, right? He, he desires after it over life itself, right? And we will see what this represents. So Esau says that my brother is a, is a hairy man, he has on this red garment, but he is a smooth man. So what does this represent? Well, in 1 Samuel 17 and verse 40, it says that he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag which he had, even in a scrip, and his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. So 
The five smooth stones is these five wise virgins that the Lord uses to bring down this, this great image. So J Jacob is saying that, that I, I'm a smooth man, right? He's representing one of these uh, wise virgins. Whereas Esau, he has on this, this red garment, this, this garment of sin, right? But let's look what it says in Genesis 27 and verse 12. It says, My father, peradventure, will feel me, and I shall seem to him as a deceiver, and I shall bring a curse upon me and not a blessing. So Jacob realizes that if he does this thing, he's going to be seen to be a deceiver, he's going to be accused of being a deceiver, and he's going to bring a curse upon himself and not a blessing. Did they call Christ a deceiver? Yes, in Matthew 27 and verse 63, saying, So we remember that the deceiver said, While he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. So Christ, he was called a deceiver. And so Jacob says, I will, I will be seen to be a deceiver and I'm going to bring a curse upon myself. Did Christ bring a curse upon himself? Yes. And, and Galatians, we'll read it in a moment, but in Matthew 16 and verse 24, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And in Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. So Christ was a deceiver, and he brought a curse upon himself. This is how we can see Jacob as a type of Christ. Okay, Christ was fulfilling all the things that we have to go through. We have to follow him. We're going to be called a deceiver and we're going to bring a curse upon himself. But this is what we must do in order to obtain the birthright. Okay, we must want it with all our heart like Jacob. Even though literally it was an unrighteous act, prophetically it's pointing to us this is the way to obtain it, right? Uh, and his mother, his mother, a woman in Bible prophecy represents a church, right? So you have to see this point, right? She says in verse 13, Genesis 27, verse 13, and his mother said unto him, Upon me be thy curse, my son, only obey my voice and go fetch me then. Now, You'll get this in a moment, because in Matthew 27, verse 25, Then answered all the people and said, His blood be upon us and on our children. So, they got the opportunity to choose the people, and they chose Christ over Barabbas. It was representing these two goals, Sister White says. Right? So when they chose Christ, they put upon him this red garment, this garment that they put upon, and they stuck him on the cross, right? Let's, let's see this. Um, <clears throat> Genesis 27, 15. And Rebekah took a goodly raiment of her elder son Esau, which were with her in the house, and put them upon Jacob, her younger son. So what does she do? She puts on him this goodly garment, and she put the skins of the kids' goats upon his hand, upon the smooth of his neck. She's putting on him this royal garment, as it says, but it was a filthy garment, what the Spirit of Prophecy says. It was an old kingly garment. They were mocking him with it, this scarlet robe that they stuck upon him, right, which is scarlet is red. And his mother is putting this, this garment upon him and putting the skins upon his hand, which is symbolically this red garment. He's pretending now to be Esau, the firstborn, so that he can get the firstborn, right? He's supplanting him, right? He's taking his place. Antichrist here takes the place of Christ. Jacob's being a type of Christ. These are the ones that claim to be like Christ. They claim to be sanctified. But they are putting themselves in place of Christ. Whereas Jacob obeys Christ, 
<laughs> does anything to get this uh, um, <clears throat> this birthright. I mean, literally, it was wrong. But prophetically speaking, Jacob is a symbol, right? Christ got all these points from this story that they would put a garment on him, that they would call him a deceiver, that they would put him on the cross. This is the curse. And in all these things, Christ knew all this from these stories in the Old Testament. So when his mother says, um, upon me be thy curse, she's the one that stuck this garment on him. She represents the people that chose Barabbas over Christ. She had to repent later for that sin. She repented of that, praise God. But prophetically speaking, she represents this great multitude that says, his blood be upon us, right? So you ought to see that that's really, really nice. Because in Matthew 27, verse 28, it says, they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe, right? So for the same illustration, this all came from the Old Testament. So last point is in Genesis 27, verses 18 to 20. And he came unto his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, who art thou, my son? And Jacob said unto his father, I am Esau, thy firstborn. I have done according as thou badest me. Arise, I pray thee, sit and eat of my venison, that thy soul may bless me. And Isaac said unto his son, How is it that thou hast found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord thy God brought it to me. So you've got to understand this. Esau, he's gone out looking for venison. This represents public evangelism. He's gone out to try and win souls. Whereas um, <clears throat> Jacob, who was tarrying, right, he says, the Lord brought it to me. Okay, the, 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 there's a difference. It is something prophetic that the wise will understand. How, what does this mean? Well, if the if the venison that he's going out to look for is a symbol of public evangelism, then these two goats, which is a symbol of, of Leviticus 16, but all, is a symbol of this righteous message, um, says the Lord has, has brought it to him, right? It's, it's marking how the, the, the Gentiles that he's going out to look for are going to come directly to him because this is the promise. The promise is that you will inherit the Gentiles, right? So let's see this in Acts chapter 10, verses 9 to 17. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Right here. And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened, and a seven vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet, knit at the four corners and led down to the earth. Wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice. And the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. The Lord brought them to him, not vice versa. Okay, so right at the sixth hour, it comes to this point where the Gentiles, they're going to, or at least the first fruits of the Gentiles are going to start coming and inquiring. This is the promise to those that tarry. Those that go out and look for it in their own strength, right? You are sinful, God hates you, and you're going to have all your sins placed back upon your head right here because when you get reproved, because you have no got the spirit anymore, you have the spirit of Satan. That's why you're doing all these wonderful, um, <clears throat> you know, wonderful works, these miracles and that that you're claiming to do. It's all from Satan. Therefore, you have the spirit of Satan. You've received the mark of the beast. And you also persecuted your brother. You're going to get the sins put right back upon your head right here. This is the gospel. And it's, it's just so 
profound how all this is coming together. Especially that these right here are going to fulfill the sins of their fathers, which is this first group of false prophets in 2014. When we got purged of this sin, they're going to repeat it right here, repeating the sins of the fathers. So, I pray that people would study this out for themselves prayerfully, with great fear in their hearts, and not with pride, thinking that we know all things, because we surely don't. And I pray that the Lord would reveal this, because this is about to come to pass. And I say, let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your um, wonderful revelations. They are deep, Lord. And we know that only the wise will understand. Um, and that's nothing to crow about, Lord. That's nothing to think highly of ourselves about. But rather with fear, Lord, we should constantly keep ourselves before you, confessing our sins, feeling our need, and trusting, Lord, tarrying in our tents, waiting for you, Lord, to fulfill your great promise in each one of us. And fear, Lord, lest we should lift ourselves up and think highly of ourselves. Remembering that we are to love our enemies, to love our brethren, those that hate us, despise us. And Lord, it's not normal for us to do that, so please give us thy grace. Please put this right spirit upon our hearts, Lord. Fill us with the spirit that comes from above, Lord, and not from below. That we might fulfill uh, your requirements and obtain the promise, not by might, not by power, but by thy spirit. We thank you, Lord, and we pray that you will bring all these things to pass exactly according to your will. And we ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.